It is, uh, I think we should start yes. for no apparent reason and that we're here. Um, <laughs> I am a little uh, uh, under the weather, so uh, I'm going to, I, I was warning everyone on the panel, I had a tooth extracted yesterday, and so if you begin to see me sort of lie down, <laughs> don't worry, I'm fine, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, so uh, I just want to, I'm Nancy Gertner, I'm a former federal judge, and before that I was a criminal defense lawyer and a, a civil rights lawyer, and I teach here, and one of the things that I teach is uh, sentencing, and one of the things that evolved from that sentencing course was the notion that, the, which was not a brilliant observation, which is that the criminal justice system is a system, and that every participant in it plays a role, and I uh, suffered through 17 years in which my role as judge was arguably the least important uh, of the system, arguably. Uh, I suffered under a system of mandatory minimum sentences and mandatory guidelines for much of my career as a judge, uh, in which essentially the prosecutor sentenced. Prosecutor sentenced by the, by the charges that he chose, uh, the decisions that he made that substantially constricted my ability uh, to deal with sentencing. Now, candidly, and now I can be candid since I'm no longer on the bench, <laughs> I did a whole lot of stuff. Uh, I, I, I did what I could within the framework that I had, but the bottom line was, as I am writing about now, I would say about 80% of the sentences that I was obliged to hand out in drug cases were unfair, unjust, and disproportionate. And I will say that now and describe in what I'm writing about why. But it then means that we've created a system in which a prosecutor is incredibly significant, uh, which is why this, this conference is so important. Uh, I'm only the moderator, which, as any of you know, is very difficult for me, but I will try to control myself, <laughs> particularly since I'm a little groggy. Um, and so I think we'll begin with everyone introducing themselves and then start with Mark in the order that they're seated. That way I don't have to make any decisions. Why don't you start? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melba Pearson. I am the Deputy Director of the ACLU of Florida. Previously to that, um, actually I started in February of this year, I had been a prosecutor in Miami-Dade County for 16 years. When I ended my career, I ended as the Assistant Chief in the Career Criminal Robbery Unit, um, prosecuting homicides and armed robberies. Uh, I'm also the immediate past president of the National Black Prosecutors Association. So I, I know some people will be like, okay, so you went from being a prosecutor to the ACLU, like how did, how did that work? <laughs> but for me, I didn't think it was much of a leap from the standpoint of as a prosecutor, I was working uh, very, very closely with a lot of leaders across the country on criminal justice reform. That was something that I was always interested in. And looking at the state of our communities of color, I know that more is needed than just throw someone in prison and lock away the key because 83% of people who go to prison come back out. And where are they coming back? To the same communities. So if there's no infrastructure and if there's no <laughs> services to assist people, we're going to just keep having the same problem over and over again. So uh, that's my story, and I look forward to talking with the rest of the panelists and with you in the question and answers. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rasan Hall. I am the director of the Racial Justice Program for the ACLU of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, brought, I, brought, I brought a crew with me. <laughs> um, uh, prior to that, I was the Deputy Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights uh, and Economic Justice here in Boston. And then before that, uh, I was a prosecutor here in Suffolk County for eight years. I began my tenure uh, under Ralph Martin and uh, then uh, finished it under Dan Conley. And so uh, I know both Adam and Jack uh, and Donna, who's somewhere uh, in here. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's interesting for me is my, my first job out of law school was the public defender's office in Dade County. And part of the reason was because when I was in school, uh, I was in school at the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, and I saw Johnny Cochran, and I was like, I'm going to be him. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so me and all my friends that I hung out with in law school were saying, we're going to pattern ourselves to become these uh, criminal defense attorneys. 
Uh, and so I was in Miami, and for family reasons, I came back to Boston and was looking for work. Uh, and Ralph Martin knew my father and heard I was looking for work and said, you know, I hear your son's in town looking for work. Do you think he would want to come and work uh, here in the DA's office? And my father, knowing who I was, said no. <laughs> but he needs a job, so I'm going to send him to you. Um, and, and, and real quickly, and I'll end here, is one of the things that happened during the interview is, you know, I expressed the struggle that I had uh, thinking about being in this role as a black man sending other black people to jail. Uh, and the thing that he said to me is like, look, I understand that as a black man. I, I appreciate that perspective that you bring. He said, but one of the things that you need to realize is that the people who are the victims of these crimes and the people whose communities are impacted by these crimes deserve to see you in court representing them and their interests. Um, and so that uh, is something that I took to heart when I took on that role uh, of a prosecutor. So I look forward to the rest of this conversation. And uh, I'm Mark Osler, and uh, Judge Gertner, I appreciate you letting me introduce myself because I'm a little worried about what you might say. Um, Fair enough. She, she knew me when I was a prosecutor, and I remember some significant eye rolls uh, during our discussions. Um, I, I was a prosec federal prosecutor and assistant U.S. attorney in Detroit from 1995 to 2000. Uh, after that, I went and uh, began teaching criminal law at Baylor down in Waco, Texas, and was there for 10 years. And for the past seven years, I've been at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Okay, Mark, why don't you start? All right. I will pepper you with embarrassing questions. I'll, I'll, I'll wait anxiously for that. <laughs> and I'm going to stand because I heard some people in the back saying they couldn't see the, the speaker. So um, I am not from a family of lawyers. I'm from a family of social workers and artists. And, uh, well... <laughs> Yeah, it's got my crowd already, all right. Um, I, I got into law because I had a history degree, went back to Detroit, and couldn't find a job. Uh, I was delivering flowers. There was a little ad in the newspaper that said young, resourceful person needed, which could be a lot of things. Um, it turned out to be a, a firm that needed a, a process server. And that's how I got into law. And what I learned as a process server in Detroit, going out and meeting the people who were being sued, was how compelling the stories were on the ground. So I decided I wanted to go to law school. And my whole family said I should not do that, but I, I did anyways. <laughs> and, and when I was in law school, um, I took the sentencing class that, that Dan Freed taught and that later Judge Gertner um, taught. Um, and it was, it was remarkable, and I was hooked, and I decided I wanted to go into criminal law. And I wanted to go back to Detroit and be a prosecutor. My first memory is the riots, the insurrection in 1967, of going outside and smelling things burning. Um, and I think that left me with a desire for order, in a way, um, in in. Dan Freed's class, I was one of the few people who was really a true believer in the sentencing guidelines, believing in the uniformity and the fairness that I thought we would find there. Um, so I did go back to Detroit. I became a federal prosecutor. And I want to talk about some of the things that I saw there, about the culture um, in that office. Uh, one of the things was that guidelines and mandatory minimums to someone like me uh, mattered in a way that perhaps is unseen, and that is that they normalized bad decisions. That my instinct might have been to do something different, but when you have an objective standard that's held out, or a seemingly objective standard that has an impartial number attached to it that's going to apply to any anybody, then, then it's okay. And you're given approval to do that because there's, uh, there's direction to do that. Um, it offers this sheen of legitimacy to what should be illegitimate to our consciences. The second thing is that I saw and felt, um, as the 27-year-old prosecutor, the bottom-up effects that are too often ignored as well. We talk about the decisions prosecutors make, and we look at laws and supervision. But we don't talk often enough about the bottom-up effects of the agents and the investigators who want you to take the case, want you to go for the maximum sentence, because that's sometimes the metrics they are judged on. Um, and 
we have a great experiment on this recently, which is that Eric Holder issued two significant memos regarding prosecution and charging and pleas. One was in 2010, and it was pretty general. It said, uh, you know, charge the, the most serious, readily provable uh, crime with these exceptions and take these things into account. It gave people a lot of leeway. Now, it was a change from the prior memo, which was harsher. We barely saw any perceptible difference in outcomes after that memo was issued. But in 2013, he issued uh, uh, two more memos. And they gave specific direction about when not to charge enhancements and when not to charge the amount of narcotics, both of which led to mandatory minimums in higher sentences. And what we saw is when those, that more specific memo came out, the sentences did go down. And there were fewer of those uh, mandatory minimums that were, that were sought. What was going on was this, that a prosecutor like me, where previously an agent would come in and lean on me and say, you know, well, <clears throat> you got to do the, the mandatory minimum. This is a bad guy. After 2013, that prosecutor could say, I can't. There's this memo. It's telling me that I can't in this situation. And the fact that the 2013 memo mattered and the 2010 memo didn't, uh, I, I think is significant. Third, race matters. I was a prosecutor in Detroit in, 19, in the 1990s. You would think in that environment, we would be talking about race all the time. I was a starting prosecutor. I was in general crimes. I was doing a lot of crack cases, uh, dozens of them. And it was all black defendants. And those were the cases in which we enhanced with mandatory minimums most consistently. Yet we never talked about race. We had, I had a, a, a black uh, US attorney I had a lot of black colleagues. We did not talk about race or the racial effects. I left the office in 2000. Um, I wish I could say that you know I had this. I saw everything and realized what was happening. But the truth is that uh, there were defense attorneys, two in particular, uh, in the Federal Defender's Office. I always use their name because I think they're heroes in a way. One was Richard Helfrich, and there was a guy named Andrew Densimo. And they used to do something when we had those mandatory minimum cases. Typical case, you've got an 18-year-old kid. He's got 5.3 grams of crack and a gun under a couch cushion. And it's a mandatory 10 years, five for the crack, five stacked for the, for the gun. And so that 18-year-old is going to go away for 10 years without, without parole. Uh, and in those cases, there was nothing to argue about at sentencing. Yet Densimo and Helfrich would argue. And the judges used to call it their futile speech. And they'd go on about what was going to happen to that kid, about what had happened to the community that he'd been plucked out of, how you could drive by that house and there'd be someone else doing the same thing there now, that it was solving no problem. Uh, let me talk a little bit about reforms and, and what we could do better. First of all, we should learn the lesson of the Holder Memo. This is something very specific, that we know that if we restrict the discretion of prosecutors some, uh, one of the effects is that that allows them to resist the pressure from underneath more effectively. And I think that really matters. And we know that the second Holder Memo really did matter in that, that way. Number two, we need better metrics of success. That it's not always about body counts, but sometimes it is. Too often it is. Um, if, if, for example, narcotics. If we want a metric of a success with narcotics, it's going to be the price of narcotics on the street because it's a market. And markets, if you restrict the supply and demand remains constant, the price will go up. And we can tell. We can measure that. And especially people in prosecutor's office have access to the information because the people they work with have informants in the street who are buying drugs. We used to talk about it all the time, what the price on the street was. But if we were doing our job and solving a problem, the price would have gone up. But we never talked about that proper metric. We talked about what our outcomes were at sentencing instead. Um, third, race still matters. <laughs> it hasn't changed. And, and I, I want to tell you a story um, not that long ago. I was in Washington, D.C., and I was on a radio show uh, hosted by a guy named Roach Brown, who uh, got clemency from President Ford. And Nikichi Taifa from uh, Open Society and I were on the, the show. And there was a, a knock on the door, and a staff person came in and said, Eleanor Holmes Norton wanted to come and be on the show. I guess she'd been listening to the show. So she came in, and I was, I was 
thrilled to meet her. And Nikichi introduced me to her and told her some of the things that, that I'd been working on, you know, the 100 to 1 ratio and things like that. Um, and I wanted to hear Eleanor Holmes Norton say, you're good. But she didn't. She said in a very cold tone, so this is penance. And I let that roll around for a while in my head. This is penance. Why would she say that? And you know, it occurred to me that someone in her position has white people coming up all the time wanting absolution, wanting her to say, you're good, things are fine, and they're not fine. Yeah. And we need to recognize that and stop looking to feel good about ourselves, instead addressing the underlying problems that continue. Um, just a, as a final note, you know, we don't know when things work. I heard the people on the first panel and the, the passion with which they spoke. And I know being in that seat sometimes, you know, you've got a crowd of 11 people sometimes. You have a, some people who don't sound like they're listening. Um, it feels like a futile speech. <laughs> uh, but maybe it's working, and we never know. Because you know, in, in, in movies, they always have a parade for you when you do something right. <laughs> but that's not the way the world works. And uh, what happened with Andrew Densimo um, was that, that after I went to work at Baylor, I started to work on the 100 to 1 ratio. In 2009, I won a case in the Supreme Court, Spears versus United States, where the court said that judges could categorically reject uh, the 100 to 1 ratio. And a lot of judges appreciated that in the case that preceded it, Kimbrough, and that it gave them more discretion. I think you did, Judge. <laughs> and there was a judge from Detroit who called me up, uh, and uh, Art Tarnow. And Judge Tarnow said, what happened to you? You are a hard ass. <laughs> and uh, I said, I didn't think I was, but, uh, but I told him. I told him about the feudal speech. And he asked me a question I'll never forget. He said, did you ever tell Andrew? And I never had. Uh, and so those waves we send out when we try to make things better, we don't know when they're working. But it's still worth making the futile speeches. So uh, the rest of the story uh, from when I went to interview with uh, Ralph Martin, was he sent me to speak to his um, chief of the district courts, Andrea Cabral, uh, who later came, became sheriff of Suffolk County. And she asked me, why do you want to do this job? And I said, I don't really. My dad told me I had to come. <laughs> and her jaw literally hit the ground. She was like, I got a line of people out this door that want to do this work, and you're talking about you don't really want to do this. You're just coming because your dad told you to. But later, um, you know, after she hired me, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and we've had an opportunity to talk about this on several occasions, and one of the things that she told me was, that was one of the reasons I hired you, because I knew that you were going to bring a level of integrity to this work because you weren't in it for some of the traditional motivations uh, that people had to do this work, the glory and the excitement of being the, the trial jockey, right? The person that gets the big cases and sends people away for extended periods of time. And so that resonated with me because I thought about some of the people that when I was on the hiring committee in the DA's office, I had an opportunity to see and interview and there's one interview that stood out in my mind where there was a young man who uh, had been interning in the DA's office in one of the district courts and had been there during a summer and then came back to volunteer over the school year. So he had at least a full year's worth of experience working in the district court, showing up, answering on cases, because as a law student, if you had evidence and you're in your third year, you can get 303 certified and appear in court. So he had some significant experience. And so when I asked him, what is it about this job that makes you want to do this work? And he just looked at me and he just did this and said, because it's awesome. It's like, we, we don't need to hire this person. And so there's something about the mentality of folks who want to do this work 
uh, that needs to be examined and evaluated and we need to question why they're in this work and what are their motivations for this work and then when they get into the office how are those motivations and desires examined and restructured and reframed so that the prosecutor's office is seriously serving the communities in a healthy and holistic way. I remember, thank you. I remember when I was in district court, I started out in Dorchester District Court, uh, one of the busier uh, courts in Suffolk County. Uh, and the first couple of years that I was there, you know, they throw you in an arraignment session and you're getting all of these cases coming in and it's trial by fire. And I'm, I'm supposed to ask people, uh, ask the judge to hold somebody on bail. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And every supervising prosecutor I had on the case said, well, you ask 10 different prosecutors, you're going to get 10 different answers for what's an appropriate bail. There were no metrics to determine what is an appropriate bail amount to set to ensure that someone not is kept off the street because they're dangerous, because that's a separate hearing. That's a dangerousness hearing. We're just trying to ensure that people come back to court the next day. And the prosecutor tells me, you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. And I'm sitting here with no type of training around that, supposed to make up a number about what is an amount that's going to guarantee that a person shows back up to court with no evaluation of that individual's ability to pay. And Mass Inc. has done a study that shows that there are a disproportionate amount of people who are sitting held on bail in jails because they can't afford to make a $50 bail, to make a $500 bail. <laughs> Shout out to the Massachusetts Bail Fund who goes and pays bails for people who are held on bail, right? And it's not because they are dangerous. It's because there's a fear that they're not going to show up and that these are amounts are set, and there's no training around that. And so what is the, the training and the framing uh, that happens for people? And so in order to, in my mind, be promoted, in order to move along the ranks in the office, I tried to take on as many cases to show that I was capable of handling a heavy caseload and capable of taking on these trials and doing well in trial. And that was something that I understood were the metrics that I was being evaluated from. There was no memo that said in order to be pro uh, promoted, you have to have this many trials and you have to have this many convictions and you have to have people sent away for this many years. Nobody wrote that down anywhere, but that's what was understood. That's what was talked about. When people asked you how many trials did you have, you pulled out your notebook and had a list of all the trials that you had and whether they were guilty or whether they were not guilty and whether or not it was a lengthy sentence. So those were some of the factors that were shaping and forming the minds of young prosecutors who were just coming in uh, to the district courts. And the other way, because we wanted those trials, well, how do we get trials? You leverage trials. You either get the guilty plea or you force somebody to go to trial by not breaking down the case. So it's a mixed bag, right? Because we feel that sometimes people are just going to take the guilty plea that we offer because they don't want to run the risk of facing an exorbitant <laughs> sentence. In district court, the mandatory minimum sentences aren't as lengthy as they are in superior court. So a lot of times the unwritten rule and the commentary along my, among some of my colleagues was, well, don't break it down, force it to go to trial. That way people were forced to go up against these heavy sentences so that a young prosecutor could get trial experience. Those were some of the things that happened in my experience coming up uh, in this office. And there's the, you know, we talked about that one case. There were two cases that kind of stand out uh, in my mind in this experience. We had this understanding again in the office when people were charged with the school zone. If it was a first offense, we were willing to break it down, but it was a, a two for two, meaning a school zone carries a two year mandatory minimum sentence. And if we were going to break it down, we would suspend a two year sentence for two years. And that was really the only way that we would do that. We weren't going to dismiss the school zone and let the judge decide what the sentence was going to be. We would dismiss the school zone only if the individual pled to the sentence that we said was the appropriate sentence as a prosecutor. So there was an 18-year-old man came into the court with his mother, no prior record, and had possession with intent to distribute. I was still a relatively young prosecutor, and so I didn't have that much authority and discretion in the office. And my understanding was that the only thing I could do with this case was break it down and give this young man a two for two. And because his mother, not being familiar with the criminal justice system, said, if he's not going to jail, we'll take that. And so here's a young man who is possessing a bag of marijuana that the police officer said was indicia of an intent to distribute because of the amount and the way that it was packaged, and he was close to a park, and he has a two-year sentence hanging over his head for two years. 
Now, I don't know what ever happened to that young man. I don't know if he was on probation and he had a jerk for a probation officer that violated him or just continued his probation and then sent him away for two years. I don't know if he had a good probation officer that invested in his life to make sure that he had better outcomes in life. I have no clue. And now we sit here in Massachusetts where marijuana has just been legalized and there's a burgeoning industry that is about to take place and the people that are going to benefit from it don't look anything like that young man that I sentenced. The second case that comes to mind is when I was in Superior Court. I mean, I had a little bit more discretion, but I still had a supervisor, and there was a trafficking case. And this was not a drug kingpin. This was a man in his 70s. And the police were conducting a search warrant, and they had information to believe that drugs were being sold out of this individual's house, and they conducted a search warrant, and they found trafficking weight. But trafficking weight can be as low as 18 grams. That's four and a half packets of sugar. Now, he had, he had a little bit more of that because he was facing a more significant weight. But I just say that to say that when district attorneys talk about we reserve mandatory minimums for the worst of the worst, the drug traffickers, somebody could have the equivalent of four and a half packs of sugar. And that's trafficking weight. And they're not actually selling it. They're just possessing it. OK, so let's understand that. But this individual was facing a 15 year mandatory minimum. This was before the sentences were changed. He was 70 years old. And he was facing a 15-year mandatory minimum. And the judge called me uh, uh, sidebar in, with defense counsel. It's like, come on, Attorney Hall, can't you do something? Look at him. And he was older and he was decrepit, not because he was 70, but because he had, was in poor health. And he's like, you can't do anything for this man? It's like, yeah, I'll give him 10 years. <laughs> because that's what I had authority to do. And so that man who was 70 years old and failing health because of his own life of addiction and substance abuse was sentenced to jail for 10 years. But he's not serving a minimum mandatory sentence. But he pled because of a mandatory minimum sentence. So I think one of the things to think about, though, is, you know, and Jack, you, you talked about the difficult decisions that prosecutors have to make and the, and, the, and the concerns for safety and for the community, and that is all very true. There's also this other reality that when I was in district court and even when I was in superior court, there are a lot of people that are coming through the criminal justice system that are not the worst of the worst. They are caught up and entangled and ensnared in a system in communities that are over-policed. ACLU, we did a report in 2013, even though black folks make up 24% of the city of Boston's population, they make up 63% of the people that are FIO'd or stopped in the city and surveilled. So there's a greater likelihood that they're going to be entangled in the criminal justice system. And so we have to realize that just because they're in court or just because they've been charged doesn't mean that they're a bad person or that they are necessarily guilty of the crime that they've committed. They're just living in over-policed communities. So finally, the things that kind of we need to do to think about how we change this and how we change the culture of policing. Data, 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 data. District attorney's offices can say that we're not racist and that we're not you know, uh, contributing to the problems of racism or racial disparity. We just get what society hands us. Prove to me that. Prove that to me. How do we know that the bail recommendations that district attorneys are making aren't racially disproportionate? How do we know that the sentencing recommendations that they're making aren't racially disproportionate? Because they don't track race data, or at least that's what they tell us when we ask for records. They say we don't collect that data. We need to, have to, hold, we need to start holding them accountable to ask them or to demand them to start recording that type of data. Community engagement, one of the things that gave me peace of mind in doing the work that I was doing, I was a part of the Safe Neighborhood Initiative, so I went out into the community on a regular basis to engage community stakeholders to find out what were the things that the community wanted to see happen. We were charged with developing a coordinated public safety agenda. I was also engaged in a, a understanding violence curriculum with students in schools, and so it was all about really trying to engage in the community, having interface in the community. We, had, we started a soccer tournament when I was there, and then a, a basketball tournament, and those are some of the things that break down those barriers and allow individuals to develop empathy and connections with the community of the people that they're prosecuting, so it's not just somebody listening to a police officer saying he's a bad dude, you need to lock him up. We need to look at diversion and more diversion, earlier diversion and more diversion. And then finally, um, we, we need to be intentional in talking about race. 
We need to be intentional about talking about race and how people are brought into the system. We need to be intentional in talking about race and talking about how people are moving through the system. We need to be intentional in talking about race and talking about who is coming into prosecutors' offices and the charging decisions and the sentencing decisions and the cases that, that we decide to take up on appeal. Race needs to be a conversation in all of those things. Thank you. Well, good afternoon at this point. <laughs> so a little bit about my story. I'm originally born and raised in New York, and I was a brawler, plain and simple, OK? I like to argue. I was fast on my feet. And being a lawyer was something that, in growing up in a West Indian household, you better pick a profession. You're either going to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer. There's nothing in between. There's no marketing. There's no being an actress. No, no, no. You're going to have a profession. So. I applied to both public defenders and prosecutors' offices. And within three months of beginning the interview process, I was given an offer in Miami-Dade County. Knowing nothing about Miami-Dade other than the show Miami Vice at the time, yes, I'm dating myself. Um, I packed up my stuff, got on a Pan Am flight, dating myself again, and uh, moved to Miami to start my career. And it took some twists and turns. I was there for a year. I left. I came back. But one of the things that I always noticed was that I was alone. Now, there were other you know, African Americans that, or people of color in, in the office. But often, I'm standing in a courtroom where the defense attorney was white, the judge was white, the court reporter was white, but the defendant was African American and would look at me like, <laughs> So it only took a few times of that for me to realize that there, there is a problem here in the system. And in my approach, I was always, I guess because I'm, I'm a very inquisitive, inquisitive person, I wanted to know what the defendant's story was. So I would ask the defense attorney, hey, so what's going on with your guy? Can, can we get him drug treatment? What, you know, what can we do? Oftentimes, the defense attorney was not interested in what the defendant's story was. And that, again, was troubling to me. Additionally, there were plenty of times when I was mistaken for the court clerk, <laughs> for the court reporter, uh, for anyone other than the prosecutor. And again, it was because people's viewpoint was that a prosecutor couldn't possibly be African American. You couldn't possibly have a role or a voice in this system. This is a white man's game. Not even a white woman's game, a white man's game. And I had faced, I'm trying to look for a polite way to say it, but you know, there are times when people would doubt my abilities because of who I was and, and why I was there. So as, we, you know, as I grew in my career and I grew more courage, that courage that comes with experience, I was able to call out police officers in a way that I couldn't have gotten away with in my first year. I was able to drop cases because I'd say, look, this is garbage. We're not doing this. And I would get some pushback, but I it, it never cost me my job. Let's put it that way. And I think that bravery only comes after at that six, seven year mark. It doesn't come in your first year because you don't feel empowered to do that. I was blessed to be working for an office in Miami that's very progressive. So we received training, and it wasn't about the metrics of, OK, how many guilties can you get? It, that wasn't one of the, the drivers. Clearly, you had to be trial active, because why else are you there, right? But it wasn't very, if you don't try enough cases, you're not going to be promoted. You're not going to get money. It, it wasn't like that. And this state attorney did have an, a, a huge thought process that, what can we do to help the community? So she was one of the first in the country to uh, do mental health diversion, drug courts, things like that. So th that kind of skewed my view on what prosecution should be. It was only when I started uh, traveling as part of being president of the National Black Prosecutors Association that I realized that was not the norm. That diversion was not a discussion that was being had nationally, especially when you got to smaller jurisdictions. And 
as a result of that, I realized, okay, we got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. So one of the things I guess we were discussing was, what was that case? What was that case that stayed with you? There's two. There was one where I was investigating a, a robbery case, an armed robbery, trying to decide whether or not I should file charges. It was a young man who apparently was, you know, he had some trouble in the past, but was now in church and trying to get his life together. And, you know, the detectives came and they're like, we have all this evidence and this and that. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Hang on. I got to do my due diligence. As I investigated the case, I was like, you know what? There's not enough here. So I got up in court. And again, this is career criminal, offender court, repeat offender, you know, allegedly the worst of the worst, right? And I got up and I said, I'm not going to pursue charges in this case. And the judge kind of looked at me, but he knew what I was about, so he didn't say too much. But literally, the defendant grabbed me, picked me up, and hugged me. And I'm talking packed courtroom, right? So I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm like, there's this dude hugging on me, and that's a whole other story. But, but it was just in that moment, that moment of joy, and knowing that, you know, the joy that he felt, and knowing that I was able to potentially save his life. And I just looked at him, I was like, well, just, just do, you know, don't get into situations again, please. Because <laughs> the next person may not be me. Mm. So that, that's something that stayed with me. And the case, I think, that really started that turning point of me thinking about, I got to do something else, was I did a, a, a case that was a homicide. It was two African-American men that went to a nightclub. They decided to step out because it was the heat playoffs and the heat weren't doing so well, so they stepped out and decided to smoke a joint. The security guard was white and he was armed. He didn't like the looks of them. He engaged with them, and as they were getting out of their car, he opened fire. He, he hit one who was sitting in the driver's seat. He is now paralyzed. He shot around the front of the car, and then as the other gentleman was crawling away, he executed him on the ground. Of course, he claimed stand your ground. Because, I mean, they were gangsters. They had guns in the car. They were, they were horrible people. Mind you, there was no guns ever found in the car or anything like that. But it took me on this very interesting journey between what our laws are in this country, especially when it comes to stand your ground, especially as to who can assert stand your ground mm -hmm. successfully mm -hmm. and who cannot. It became a very racially charged trial. It was in the media. And I was able to get a guilty verdict. But it didn't leave me with that sense of satisfaction. I was glad that I brought closure to the family. But the amount of pain that family went through, the amount of dragging of innocent victims that was done in that courtroom was just unacceptable to me. And how these two men were vilified, one in death, and one who testified from his hospital bed, literally. I wheeled him in on a hospital bed and made him testify for the jury. That was the case that broke me. And that's when I realized, number one, that prosecutors get PTSD, because I didn't realize that. Because I'm like, why are they crying for two weeks straight? Don't understand that. That's not like me. <laughs> yeah, that's stress, OK? Because you are dealing with some heavy things. And also the pain of not being able to really help people. And as a result of that and, and some of the work I'd been doing across the country, I started to think about, okay, what can I do on a national level? What can I do on a statewide level to address these inequities in these laws, to uplift communities of color, to make sure that their voices are being heard in the criminal justice system? And this opportunity came forth. So what are some things that, that are really important for us to consider as, as a community, um, as actors in the criminal justice system? Engaging the community is critical. You can't talk about folks and not have them in the room. When you're having discussions about communities of color and the criminal justice system, you need to have representatives from the community at the table to tell you what they want. Don't assume. That's number one. <clears throat> number two, when you're looking at community engagement, I spent about two years in the community outreach division of, of the state attorney's office. And that, having been a native New Yorker, Miami has its own flavor, its own beat, its own issues. Some things overlap, but every community is different. So that was a very edu educational experience for me because I learned what made people tick and I learned where the pain was. 
And once you engage in that manner, there's no way that you can view people as us versus them because you are with them, so we are all one. And the only way to break down that barrier is to literally sit and break bread with people. So that is something that prosecutor's offices should do as a requirement, that every prosecutor's office requires every prosecutor in their office to volunteer for whatever it is, eight hours a month, whatever the case may be, and be in an affected community, not just go and like read books to like you know the white privileged high school, right, and call that community service. It's not. You got to get in there and do the work. And that means volunteering at a homeless shelter, volunteering at a domestic violence shelter, volunteering at what is no, known as like a housing project and offering services and finding out what, what folks need. That dialogue is critical before there's a flashpoint, before something terrible happens. Also, prosecutors can't do it alone. Everybody has to come together in this process, which means the public defenders have to speak up when they not, are not getting enough funds to properly hire enough public defenders to represent people. Community has to speak up for what they need. And prosecutors have to speak up as well. We're not gonna have change if you just focus on one side of the equation. You have to look at everyone. And lastly, everyone in this room can play a role as well because you vote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you need to let your legislators know, hey, you need to be funding criminal justice reform. You need to be funding treatment for people who suffer with mental health concerns. You need to be funding drug rehabilitations. Because many times prosecutors get up in there and say, I'd love to do all these wonderful pro uh, programs, but the legislature doesn't give me any money. I'm barely able to pay my, my lawyers as it is. Well, it's time for the legislator, legislature to free up some more money. Simple as that. And so when the voting public demands it, legislators know it, my job depends on this. And if the voters aren't happy with me, they can vote somebody else in. So we have to use our voice, collective voice, as voters and as the community to say that we want criminal justice reform. That's it. So I'm going to ask one question, which will be a question in 15 or 16 parts, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So there are three broad themes that people have talked about. One is a question, one was this notion of we select prosecutors in their late 20s. It's very interesting. If prosecutors are essentially judges in the system, we don't put 20-year-old judges on the, the bench. You know, you wait until judges are sort of seasoned. So is there something about who we select? It's a startup job for young uh, lawyers who know nothing, as you all have reflected. Um, you grew into the job. So is there something about who we select and what can be done about that? Then the other broad theme was the theme of discretion, the amount of discretion that a prosecutor has. And we talked about training. Um, I have a parallel discussion with judges all the time, you know, that as if, as if the answer to criminal justice reform is giving discretion to good people. I don't believe that giving discretion to good people without telling them or framing or giving suggestions as to what to do. In other words, we don't talk about the substance. We only talk about the location of discretion. And when you talk about training, training to do what? So one thing that was interesting was Mark's uh, observation about uh, specific directives. You know, we'll train you, but here are, here's what you ought to be doing. We should talk about what you ought to be doing in particular cases. Uh, that's one, so training needs to have substance, discretion needs to have guidelines. What ought to be, people ought to do. And the other is, is Rassan's comment about data. And, and data to some degree tells me what I shouldn't be doing. Because the data we're talking about is race, uh, which is check out how many times I'm exercising my discretion for a privileged white guy and not for a black guy. So we can talk about discretion, but we want to talk about what the content of that discretion. And the third point is when you talk about the content of discretion, there's a big difference between uh, elected prosecutors and appointed prosecutors. Hmm. So if you laid out in the Suffolk DA's office or in the Dade County DA's office what the content of discretion is, don't charge a kid in these kinds of situations. Would that become a contested political issue? 
was the thing that Mark was describing, something that could more easily happen in a U.S. attorney's office than in a uh, politicized prosecutor's office. So what do, we do about, what do we do about who we select? What do we do about discretion? And is there a difference between an elected prosecutor and an appoint? Why, is, why was Miami-Dade able to do what it was able to do? Was it a function of the community? Uh, what's the difference between an elected prosecutor and an appointed one? Anyone? Actually, I want to jump in on that because you know we're dealing with a situation in Florida with uh, Aramis Ayala, the Orlando prosecutor, who elected prosecutor, who has chosen not to use the death penalty in in any cases that come before her. Um, and that's a use of prosecutorial discretion. That's, that's the argument. We filed an amicus brief in support. But the key here is that do the voters support her? And the only way we're going to know that is in four years. But she did run on a platform that was extremely progressive. So if the voters support your reforms and what you're trying to do, I mean, we see a wave across the country, including Cook County, Chicago, where a longtime prosecutor was elected out because her viewpoints were not as progressive. And Kim Fox became the elected state attorney there. So that's why, again, I keep bringing it back to the voters, bringing it back to the voters, because it's the people who will be able to drive whether or not these reforms can happen. And if people have the appetite for it, it will happen. If you're in a conservative area where they're like, nope, hang everybody high, well, that, that is the prosecutor you're going to get because that is the mentality. Um, I, in regards to who, who, who hot gets hired, I mean, it's hard to tell somebody who's in their 30s or 40s that we're going to start you out at a salary of $30,000. Yes. Right? So that's another reason why young prosecutors, I mean, it's probably changed. That's what it was when I started. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, starting prosecutors make very little money, uh, depending on the jurisdiction. So I think that has a lot to do with it. But that said, um, that's why um, training uh, and framing becomes so important. These are the standards. This is what we expect. Like I said, when I started, I didn't know what to ask for for bail. And my supervisor said, I don't, you ask 10 different people, you get 10, like there should be some sort of evaluative process. There should be something. So I think, I think that's something. I don't know that we can get around hiring more experienced people when the starting salary uh, are, are, are so low. I think, uh, and I think that kind of gets to the discretion piece as well. You know, here's the, the training and the standards that we have. As far as the data, yes, just they need to start tracking it. Um, elected versus appointed, I mean, I think that's, problematic. I, I think we're in a better situation with them being elected because they are therefore accountable to the voters. The problem is people don't really pay attention to these races. I think the stats like 75% are run unopposed, 20%, um, what, are the, what are the stats? 85 unopposed and 95% of them win. Um, when they run a contested, uh, running a contested race. So, and then there's a, you know, and then the remainder are appointed. That's how Dan Conley got in. Ralph Martin resigned. Dan Conley was appointed. He had a race, um, and you know, the, the, the challenger that he had passed away, um, you know, and the, and the other challenger didn't, uh, submit a, you know, didn't pose a significant challenge and he's been the incumbent ever since. And that's usually um, what happens. Same with Plymouth County, Tim Cruz. Um, uh, Mike Sullivan uh, went to um, ATF, I think, and, and Tim Cruz was appointed, and he's ran, and he's been in there ever since. So it's better that they are elected, but we need to have people engaged in the political process around there. And just one, one more quick stat, 96% of the elected prosecutors are white. Men. So I think I'm going to take on parts 9 and 13 <laughs> of your question. Um, but, but in terms of who's hired and, and what happens, I mean, I think most people who are hired are not immoral. You know, they, they want to do good things. There's a few people who are immoral and want to do bad things probably, but there's a lot of people who are amoral. And that is, it's a job. It's a job. It's a decent job. It's going to be interesting. They're getting trial experience. And that means that the culture of not just the office, but of the investigators is going to shape them, is going to provide that morality. And that's why restrictions like the Holder Memo are worthwhile, is for the immoral, or I'm sorry, the amoral 
uh, group. Now, there's another thing, too, is that I, I don't want to ignore the, the long-term prosecutors. I mean, one of the things that, that came up before is that criminal law is all tragedy, mm. every bit of it. And if you have your eyes open and you go through a day in criminal court, if you live that life, it is overwhelming. If you feel the emotions, if you know what the price is to the defendant, if you see what the harm is to the victims or to the potential victims that may come later, it is exhausting emotionally. And people develop coping mechanisms for that. They close themselves off. They take the guidelines as their own moral code. And that is as damaging as anything else. You know, one thing that this conversation also brought out is the notion of metrics. What if a prosecutor ran for office and the metric was... Uh, you know, the impact on the communities of the mandatory minimum sentences or the metric was the recidivism rate. What if the metric was, you know, we, we, we don't hold anyone responsible for the whole. We then go to the legislature and say the recidivism rates are ridiculous and et cetera. But what if that became, you know, recognizing the enormous power of a prosecutor, you held him accountable or her accountable for uh, recidivism, for those kinds of issues? for the, you know, you hold the Bristol County DA's office responsible for the suicides in the local jail. You hold people accountable politically, and that's a way of broadening the discussion. Would that work? Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think it would, and I think Adam alluded to that. Like, what, what, how have people's lives progressed from the time that they were arraigned to the time they've completed their probation? And the prosecutor has some say in that. Is there a diversionary program? Is there some sort of sentencing structure that incorporates, you know, rehabilitation, drug treatment, um, uh, mental health uh, issues, some sort of community service, some sort of restorative justice practices? And if that's built in to the sentencing recommendation, prosecutors can then say, these are all the people that we prosecute. In this, um, in the in the past four years, right. and and so here's their recidivism rate of these individuals. Right. The the other part that we haven't talked about, which um, my my husband, who used to be with the ACLU, John Reinstein, uh, uh, insisted that I talk about, um, is a prosecutor's role not just in charging, not just in trying the case, but in parole decisions, and that's something, Mark, that you have been tremendously involved in. Mark was largely responsible for many of the clemencies in the in the Obama, uh, the waning days of the Obama administration, prosecutors play an enormously retrograde role in parole decisions because they, after someone's been in, in prison for 15, 20 years, they come and they're eligible for parole. The prosecutor comes in as an enormous voice, first among uh, everyone else, and, and the only theme that the prosecutor at that point typically sounds is victims. The victims were harmed. This is the sentence he got. Now, that was an appropriate theme at the outset. But after 20 years in with a sick or, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or someone who's just been amazing in prison, that is not, that, that's a voice that is too loud at that stage when there should be other voices. What do we do about that? Because that's certainly nothing that you're ever trained about because no one cares at that stage. And, and, and Judge, that is something that, is so important to understand is that that for a prosecutor, think uh, those of you that haven't been prosecutors, put yourself in the position of you're in a courtroom, you're at sentencing, you are eight feet away from the person that you're saying they should be in prison for 10 years. They should miss their child's graduation. In Texas, my students there, even this person should die. And you're standing next to them in court. There's an incredible emotional commitment that goes with that, that you have asked the society to kill this person or to kill their hopes or to kill the next 10 years of their life or to kill their family. It's very hard to say later I was wrong. And, and having prosecutors have the role of, of review in second chance processes is wrong because of that. But, but that, that, so that's a structural problem that meant that when the, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court and the Massachusetts Supreme Court declared that life without parole was unconstitutional for juveniles, uh, there was a series of parole hearings in Massachusetts. I believe maybe one of these kids, there were 60, I believe that only one or two actually met parole. And part of the reason was that, that the theme at parole was the same theme as at their conviction, as if the intervening 15 or 20 years hadn't mattered. Uh, and all the teachings of the of the SJC decision were lost. 
Uh, but we don't, you don't ever get trained about that, right? You never even talk about that, but you're called upon to say something at, at parole, right? Uh, but you could, also, you could also stand mute, I think, right. uh, or send a recommendation or, you know. Right. Um, I suppose some, because we have a kind of a different system in, in Florida, we don't really have parole. Um, the Essentially, we don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we got the death penalty, but we don't have parole. Um, so that's not, a, that's not a, a, an issue for, for the current batch of prosecutors. But, you know, you still have the opportunity as a prosecutor in states where there is parole to stand mute, don't say anything, send a recommendation in writing, or actually travel in person to make your argument before the parole board. And again, I mean, going back to Mark's point, I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of commitment. And the question that the prosecutor needs to ask themselves is, am I too invested? And that I'm no longer being objective because my victory is being tied up too much in this situation or my hate for this particular, because some prosecutors hate their defendants, hate, which I mean, to me, it was always about business, right? Like, it's, this is nothing personal here that I'm looking at a set of facts, et cetera, et cetera. But some people literally hate the people they are prosecuting. And that emotion is enough to drive you to do things that may be completely inappropriate. So that's why if anyone, if a prosecutor is going to speak in a parole hearing, examine the reasons very closely as to why he or she is taking that course of action. We have time for a few, more, for a few questions from the audience. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is James Mack, and I'm a leader of a movement called Stuck on Replay. It's all about elevating voices, uplifting community, and influencing policymakers to make the right decisions. Um, and I have a confession. I don't have a question. I just have a statement that I really want to um, say real quick about the event that we have coming up because it's really important. Just give me one minute. You can it. time it. I'm all ruling. Right. One minute. All right, cool. <laughs> so we have a statewide criminal justice reform event happening. Um, and so what we're doing is we're organizing community members around the state, uh, organizations around the state that says that we need to push forward with a real comprehensive reform, criminal justice reform here in Massachusetts. I mean, if you all are following what's happening in Massachusetts in the legislation, there is not a lot of reform that's really going to sway in a progressive way, in a positive way for those who are affected most by mass incarceration, and we need you all support, not only the black and brown communities, but we need allies. So if you live outside of Boston, Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan, we need you to show up. There's flyers that are outside. There's flyers that are on the table. It's July 13th, 5 to 8 p.m. It's a Thursday, um, and we need for you all to come. And we, we, need you also, we, we also need you all to call your legislators to tell them to come, because we're inviting them as well, because we need to take them outside of the state house to come to, to the communities yeah. that are affected most yeah. by mass incarceration. <laughs> and if we, if we do not do that, then guess what? We will remain stuck on replay. <laughs> I'm tired of being stuck on replay. I know that we're here having this event because we want to learn about the role of prosecutors, prosecutors and try to humanize them and, and try to understand you know, how they're convicting people. But if we're just showing up just to get some knowledge and then go back home and live in our everyday lives, knowing that there's a real criminal justice reform that could be happening, we have this opportunity and we let it go, then that's not just my fault, but that's all of our fault. So let's not stay stuck on replay and let's show up. Thank you. Yes, Marty. Yes, uh, Marty Rosenthal. I'm uh, a criminal defense lawyer. I've been active on this stuff since 1976. Um, this is a wonderful event, and, and I commend everybody who's here and all the speakers, and I even got Professor Pfaff's uh, autograph on his book, which I commend to everybody uh, as, as an epiphany about the sentencing reform movement and what's wrong with it. And um, the talk today about uh, uh, paradigm shifts and, and all the cultural issues for prosecutors is fabulous, but um, I want to get it down to more brass tacks and pick up on two words one that Rasan mentioned and one that Nancy mentioned. Um, um, I know a lot of the people in this room. One was diversion, and, and Nancy mentioned uh, giving more discretion, but to do what? And um, there is a lot happening in Massachusetts right now. There was a big hearing at the State House June 5th. There's another one Monday on bills that are, hap that are proposed. I believe that almost all of them are falling short on both of those issues. 
Um, I think a lot more could be proposed on diversion, and some people in this room know some of the proposals I've been floating that I um, have, am frustrated that I'm not getting anybody to pick up on, maybe because they're no good, but I, I actually think it's because my emails are too long. Um, <laughs> There's something right. to that, Marty. All right, see, I'm already getting There's agreement something on that. to that, right, but, yes. So, uh, and the other thing is uh, sentencing reform, getting to Nancy's question. All of, all of my proposals give discretion for judges to uh, keep people out of the criminal justice system, keep their Cory records clean, uh, and not impede collateral consequences, and give prosecutors checks and balances and opportunities to contest those things. But on sentencing reform, the low-hanging fruit right now is drugs. And I hope it'll happen, I think it'll happen, but we need a lot more sentencing reform than drug mandatory minimums. And my last sentence is, I, I can see Nancy's face, my last sentence is I think the only way to do that is if the Sentencing Commission, which I've been involved in, does a broad sentencing guidelines and it goes to the legislature. It's not just an administrative thing and it has broad safety valve for mandatories. 80% of the uh, firearm mandatory defend incarcerated defendants right now are minorities, 80%. So we need to address that and not just drugs. That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> And, and I'll just say, Marty is correct, his emails are long, but, um, <laughs> um, and, and, and just for, for, for folks who have comments as opposed to questions, that's fine, we appreciate that, but the, the final session at the end of the day is really oh. where we want to get into that, um, as opposed to, I have a question, but then come up and make a comment. So the last session of the day, we really want to engage community and, and hear what the right. comments are as well. Let, let me just say one thing about discretion. I, I was stunned when I was a, when I was a judge the, the set federal sentencing guidelines, which were ridiculous, uh, uh, became advisory and overwhelmingly followed by judges across the country, advisory or not. And so what's happened is that over 20 years, 30 years, we have normalized ridiculous sentences, which is why uh, we, we've immunized ourselves to numbers that only, that, you know, 30 years ago were ridiculous. So the notion of giving judges discretion, discretion to do what? Discretion to uh, continue to sort of measure uh, uh, what's fair by ridiculous standards. We have to give people, we have to give people guidance. Um, I, I'm writing about the people that I sentenced, and I, the section that I'm writing now is about the classic sort of dopey uh, bank robbery case where uh, the person was addicted uh, to drugs and would go, as soon as he got out of jail, he would immediately go to the corner, to the, to the bank he had always uh, you know, held up, put his hand in his pocket, go stick him up, uh, walk outside, be covered with the dye pack, and be arrested. And the sentencing guidelines, because if he happened to take a certain amount of money and if the, if the teller was scared, was at a ridiculous level. And the level, I could get it down to another version of time. In other words, it would be instead of this amount of time, it would be a another amount of time. But time was ridiculous. The guy needed drug addiction treatment. Uh, but because of the nature of the crime, it was not even on the table. And I wanted to see the Sentencing Commission talk about sort of the, the paradigm of the dopey uh, bank robber and give people incentive to give people not just the availability of programs, because the availability of programs is wonderful, but if you're not, if you don't even see that as an option, uh, if you're not trained to see that in an option in cer certain kinds of cases, you're not going to do it. So we really have to talk about what we're doing with people and not just discretion or not discretion. Um, so Nine more words? No. Next person. The mass <laughs> guidelines bear no resemblance. <laughs> Mad at the state board guidelines. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Shyok. Uh, I work at the National Lawyers Guild, but I'm not a lawyer. I do have a question. Uh, it's, it's simple. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of trying to figure out what I want to do um, you know, later in life, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of deciding between prosecutor defense attorney, that sort of uh, dilemma. And I was wondering, um, I mean, you guys are obviously all pretty reform-minded. I mean, do you ever uh, feel that you may have had more of a, a positive impact uh, as a defense, as a defender than as a prosecutor? And do you ever, like, regret being a prosecutor? And then related, not, not I mean, it's a second question, is um, uh, one of the big sort of 
kind of false promises to me anyway for, for police departments is like officer diversity. And if we just flood the, if we just have more uh, cops of, of color, then that's, that'll just fix everything. I mean, that, that's obviously not a, a full solution by any means. I mean, do you feel that uh, in the prosecutor's office, uh, more, more minority prosecutors would help and, and or what else is needed to, to, to do that? Yeah. Okay. This so. has to be the last question I'm told by people. So if you could save your questions to the afternoon. So I've actually written about this, this issue. Look, if you're not at the table, you're going to be lunch, okay? You need to be at the table where these decisions are being made. And there's a lot of pressure that can be put on by the outside, but a lot of pressure has to come from within the system. So the prosecutor in a courtroom is the one person who has all the cards because the prosecutor decides whether or not a case should be charged whether or not it should be dropped, what the plea should be, whether or not this case goes to trial. And if there are not enough reform-minded prosecutors of all races, and if there are not enough people of color in that courtroom, you're going to have a problem. We're never going to be able to change this. And this is a cooperative effort. It's a cooperative effort. It's not, again, just done by one side versus another. But you can't have a lack of diversity with the decision makers. That, that, that's never going to move us forward. So that's my two cents. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Sorry, we're fine. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry.